Welcome one, welcome all to this pantheon of the information age. Um, before I go any further, I'd just like to thank the BBC and particularly Chris Baum for um, organising this for us and cutting through red quarter inch tape to ensure that we're here. Um, the first thing I want to bring to everyone's attention is a sign-in sheet. If you're new to the AES, please copy what everyone else is doing. Um, just, just write your name on it, we, we need it for our records. Um, and the next thing is to plug next month's event while you're all here. Um, on the 12th of November we'll be at the Dolby Theatre in Soho where we'll be presenting a... It's called Cutting Edge Technology and it's our fourth such session. Every year we showcase the work of an academic institution. This year it's Anglia Ruskin's uni Universities. I'm trying to remember what it stands for. Um, Culture of the Digital Economy Department, which is a sort of big new media thing, and they're going to be showcasing some of their audio and media related research. So that'll be extraordinarily interesting, it always is, and you'll get a chance to, to talk to people who are working at the cutting edge of research. But tonight's talk is Chris Lois, who is of the BBC and the World Wide Web Consortium, to tell us about the Web Audio API, which he's been extraordinarily heavily involved in. So I'd very much like to hand over to him. Thank you. My <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, so I'm going to talk about the Web Audio API. So I'm no longer at the BBC. This has been slight changes of billings as we went along and also was billed early on with my colleague Olivia, who is uh, not able to come tonight. So it's just me and I'm not representing the BBC, but I am kind of representing the W3C and myself. And that's kind of where you find me on the internet. So. Could I get a quick show of hands, because what I'd like to do is, if there's any questions as we go along, please, you can interrupt and shout at me. Um, and I'll take them at the end if they're going to get complicated. But it's difficult to know a little bit where to pitch this kind of material. So could I get a show of hands about, has anyone done any kind of programming, particularly programming for the web? So, well, a good half. And is anyone interested or involved in kind of education and teaching people about acoustics, audio, signal processing, that kind of thing. Okay, that's good. Okay, well, I'm going to try, that's where I'm trying to pitch it. Um, there's going to be some code, um, but hopefully nothing too scary. Uh, it's the best way to show you what, what it's all about. Anyway, me. So, I, my background is in audio and acoustics. I did my doctorate at the University of Southampton at the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research. I was there for a, as a postdoc for a little while, and uh, I got a bit tired of that and decided that I wanted to get into my hobby, which was kind of web programming and programming general, and I ended up joining the BBC. Uh, I joined the BBC as a kind of web developer in the audio and music, or radio music, audio music interactive. It had lots of different names, but I was uh, basically building the Introducing website, which was a kind of site where unsigned bands could upload their music and I kind of other music bits and pieces as well, just across the road in Henry Wood House. And then after a little bit of time at that, I, um, I joined BBC R&D. So this, is, this was, was my office. There's Andrew Mason. No, 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 no that's, uh, so that's, that's, that's R&D at Kingswood Warren, I think. But um, yeah, it hasn't changed too much, or maybe a little bit. And uh, now I work for FutureLearn, uh, which is a kind of startup looking at uh, teaching people things on the internet. So throughout my time at the BBC, I've been involved with the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium, which was the uh, standardizing organization set up by Sir Tim Berners-Lee to kind of bring a little bit of order to the web and web technologies so that you can write your websites and your web applications once and they'll run on a variety of different platforms and different browsers. And as time has gone on and more and more devices that we carry with us every day and we use every day are able to, to go onto the internet, including televisions and even radios sometimes, um, the kind of the need for standards is, is ever more important. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about audio on the web and a kind of new technology that the W3C has been trying to standardize or helping to standardize called the Web Audio API, which brings more advanced manipulation, synthesis, digital pro signal processing type applications to the web platform. I'm going to tell that story a little bit because it's a bit dry if I just take you through a specification document. So I'm going to take you through a project that I worked on with some colleagues when I was at the BBC in R&D, uh, where we uh, looked to recreate some kind of classic BBC sound effects. And I also want to show you and hopefully get you excited to try this uh, when, you, you know, when you get home and, and make you realize that the web browser that you have on your computer today is actually 
underneath a powerful audio workstation uh, waiting to, to have exciting applications built for it. So a little bit of history about audio on the web. Um, so there's lots of reasons why we want to have audio on the web um, as part of the kind of what's called the web platform. So a good example is games. Uh, how are we going to go here? So my computer's at the back, so if I disappear, it means I'm going backwards to hit a button. But hopefully you can still hear me. So here's a game. So this is a game running uh, in a browser, but this is a video to make it a bit easier for you to, uh, to see. Uh, this is Angry Birds for the Chrome web browser. Hopefully. Let's have another go. Yep. There's plenty more with that thing. So for those of you who've done any, uh, done any programming on the web before, if you're trying to do this kind of thing in a web browser, it's actually quite difficult. There's a lot of sound effects there that are having to be synchronized with what's happening on the screen and many, many overlapping sound effects. It's not a kind of piece of music that's looping. Each kind of event is triggering a, a sound. The other kind of thing we might want to do is uh, notifications. So, um, more and more applications are moving onto the web away from, uh, away from desktop at least and there's a kind of division between mobile apps and what's a web application and what's a mobile application but you often need notifications, things that alert the user to something happening uh, when they can't see the screen. And uh, another interesting application is kind of sharing and creating music or, or sound. So, so applications where you can take advantage of the web and all of the strengths that it has to kind of collaborate with people to do musical applications. So, so I'm going to show you here, uh, this is um, Jam with Chrome, which was a game um, where you can play musical instruments with other people. So when you see this, there's a few instruments playing, and these people are all over the world kind of collaborating on a little piece of music. It's kind of like a chat room, I guess, for musicians. You, you can all uh, yeah, join this, this, this environment and play your instruments. And what's been sent over the web is just the information about what needs to be played and when. But it's all been kind of rendered in the browser using the Web Audio API. So a little bit of history. So if you wanted to build this kind of application, well, to be honest, if you want to build it today and you want it to work in lots of places, but in the, in, in the last few years, if you wanted to build this kind of application, you use Flash. Um, problem with Flash is that it kind of doesn't work on iOS devices. It's one of the main problems. So it, it, it's, it's, um, its take up is, is getting less now. And, and also it's a kind of, it's a, a proprietary platform. Um, it doesn't necessarily run the same everywhere. Um, so it's kind of it's falling out of favor, let's put it that way. Uh, the other thing that's been available on the web for a while is a kind of audio tag. So this is a tag, you can wrap a file around it and it will give you a simple play button. The problem with that is when you hit play, you don't really know when the sound is going to start. You press play and it will start streaming it in. It's kind of good for radio or playing a, a song. But if you want to say, when this bird hits this other bird, play this sound exactly at that point, uh, it's not really suitable for that. So, in order to address some of these issues and kind of bring a bit more of what people were used to in Flash and other programming environments and in kind of professional audio editing environments, that kind of thing, to the web, uh, the W3C started up a, a working group to look at standardizing some proposals that had been made by various browser vendors. So, uh, so, so the BBC were founding members of that group along with Google and Mozilla. And, and Google and Mozilla both brought candidate specifications along to that process that they thought would be suitable. And what we've tried to do over time is kind of take the best bits of both of those and, uh, and turn it into a standard that can be implemented by, by all the different browser vendors. And that specification is the Web Audio API. So this is a, 
and it kind of the front page of that the, the editor's draft so it's a fairly dry document but what it does is, is describe you know how this API should be implemented on browsers so that they can take advantage of this technology so some of the features that it allows is kind of sample accurate scheduling so if you have a piece of sound you can kind of say exactly when you want it to trigger and it has a very kind of accurate clock that's running a away from the animation and the rest of the stuff that's happening in the browser so that when you say I want to play in a certain time it can kind of fairly reliably do it. Uh, it's a kind of graph based processing API which is really nice so it's if anyone's used anything like pure data or max MSP or those kind of environments the web audio API is similar so you get these kind of building blocks that have the sort of operations that you'd quite like to do within audio applications and you can use JavaScript to kind of connect them together in a, to build a kind of processing graph. Yeah, so it's simple JavaScript APIs so are building these building blocks together and uh, if you don't like what building blocks have been um, provided for you, you can write your own processing code using JavaScript. So uh, you can get access to the raw samples that are coming from a streaming radio stream or from some uh, audio file that you've loaded in and you can kind of work at it on the sample by sample level. There's a question at the back. Yeah, just a quick question. Has anyone written a patcher type environment rather than having to code itself in JavaScript? Like in uh, Max, you've got a patcher environment. Yeah, so a kind of drag and drop building block type thing. Yeah, yeah. so the, there's a guy who does developer evangelism. It's called for Google, a guy called Chris Wilson. And he's written something that's like that. I'll, if I get time towards the end, I'll try and dig it up and show you. But yeah, it's basically that you can drag and drop. And under the hood, it's writing the code for you, essentially. It's quite early days for those sorts of applications. But I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're coming along gradually. There's even been a, port of, a partial port of pure data to the Web Audio API as well. So you can kind of, yeah, bits of it work, bits of it don't. Uh, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about a project that we did to raise awareness of the API a bit more. Um, so uh, you might know this theme tune, hopefully. So that was the uh, original theme tune to Doctor Who, as, as you, I'm sure you know. Um, and it was recorded and put together at the Radiophonic Workshop. So here's a photo of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop at Maida Vale. Uh, this is uh, Delia Derbyshire, uh, who's kind of credited with, with composing the, the, the piece of music. Well, in fact, she wasn't credited with composing it. Um, she was asked at some point uh, by the person who commissioned the piece of work and, and had the kind of credit for composing it, did I write that? To which you replied most of it. So she kind of was, was involved. It was an interesting uh, environment from, from what I can tell from reading about it, um, where there was a good amount of collaboration between kind of creative composing type people and sort of people who were more kind of audio engineers who were kind of working together to, to, um, yeah, to kind of build pieces of music and compose them using uh, quite kind of rudimentary techniques at the time. So the tunes that, that you just heard, the Doctor Who theme tune, so a lot of this was, was put together by splicing together um, small tape loops. Um, so kind of recording single sounds onto a tape and then splicing them up. So that's what they're doing here, like looking at little bits of tape and kind of splicing them together to kind of put sounds together. It's quite a laborious process. So we thought that looking at some of these sound effects and how they, were, uh, how they were originally put together would be quite a fun thing to do with the Web Audio API to try and test out what, was, um, what its capabilities were and raise a bit of awareness of it. So, so we found a, a monograph in uh, the R&D library which describes some of the things that were happening around, uh, around that time in the BBC in terms of kind of sound processing and sound effects. And in it, there was a device that was described uh, for, for making um, gunshot sound effects. 
So reading from it. So prior to 1954, gunshot effects in drama were made either by the actual firing of a gun in front of a microphone or by slapping a ruler onto a table. It says the former, whilst being a pretty obvious method, was more difficult in practice than it seemed. So talking, so, so, so part, through this project, I was um, lucky to, to get introduced to Dick Mills, who was one of the people who worked at the Radio Phonic Workshop early on, and uh, he kind of told me a few stories about this. So, so one of the things about the gunshot noise generator was what was happening is they had kind of ribbon microphones with quite delicate um, transducers, ribbon transducers, and they were firing guns with blanks in them for radio sound effects and breaking the microphones. And then they would call up an engineer and say, uh, we broke the microphone again. And so I guess like, um, so being a programmer, whenever I see something happen twice, I kind of want to uh, automate it. And so I don't have to do it again. I guess they saw this and it kept happening and they thought, I wonder if there's a way that we can uh, stop them doing this. So, so what they came up with was uh, this gunshot noise machine. So, so this was a machine um, where you could, uh, you could connect it up to some speakers and run the wire off, off set and you could kind of trigger it um, when you wanted the effects to appear and it would kind of make the sound of a gunshot noise. So in the monograph there's this kind of block diagram um, of how they made gunshot noise effects. So there was a white noise generator and a gate which you could kind of open the gate by pressing the button and then it would just pass that through a low pass filter and it would sound like gunshot noise. So when we saw this diagram, we kind of thought we might be onto something because in the Web Audio API specification that we've been working on, you kind of get lots of diagrams like, like this. So this is a kind of the way that the Web Audio API is described, where you kind of have processing blocks and you connect them together. So we thought, well, maybe we could just recreate each one of these blocks in this, uh, in this monograph and see if we could kind of make the sound of gunshot noise. OK, demo. So here is the gunshot noise generator that we came up with, hopefully. Uh, yep, so, so this is uh, running inside Google Chrome. This is why I keep having to walk back here and there's a few technical problems. So this is running on, on the browser. Um, and this is kind of our, our recreation of that. So, so I can uh, trigger it like that. And then I can change the cutoff frequency, which makes it sound closer or farther away. So maybe when there's a bit of that noise has been filtered out, then it kind of sounds like cannon fire in the distance or something like that. Let's see if I can get back to my slides. Hang on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and take you through a little bit of code, which gives you a flavor of how we kind of built that um, and some of the things that you can do with the Web Audio API. So, so the first thing that you need to do is generate some white noise. So, so the way that you do that using the API, and if you have Google Chrome, you can open up the console at the bottom, the developer console, and kind of type these things in, and it should sort of work, um, is... Uh, so everything operates in terms of a context. So the context is um, the thing that abstracts the programmer away from the individual sound card and kind of makes the channels of the sound card and so on accessible and also sets a sample rate. So that sort of familiar number, 44,100, is kind of a, um, uh, the sample rate of the context in which we're working. So what we can do is create a buffer, so uh, a small amount of... Um, samples, if you like, that are pre-allocated and empty within that context. So we can do that, and we can get access to the first channel of that. So if it's a mono buffer dive by default, you can get the first channel. That's what's happening uh, in, the, in this line, get channel data. And then we can iterate over it. So uh, it looks like C. This is JavaScript, but similar kind of thing if you've, if you've used C. Um, so iterate over it to the size of the buffer, and then just set each sample to be random a random number. And that will give you um, some kind of white noise, effectively. Um, how kind of how really random it is depends on the buffer length. But for something like this, where we're kind of filtering it and gating it, then this is sufficient. So we just generate enough of it. Um, so you can do that. And then all you have to do is um, you have to create a buffer source to take the sound from that buffer, 
um, set it to the white noise. You can set it to loop, and then you just tell it to start now. And so zero is, is now. Um, but you can, this is where you could schedule it to a certain time in the future. So you start it, and it will play some white noise. Yeah, that's what I've said. So you can trigger it, or you can trigger it into the future, effectively. So we've got a burst of white noise, well, a continuously looping um, white noise source, and we want to kind of gate it, so that kind of impulse thing, create an envelope around it, effectively. So the Web Audio API provides us with something called a gain node. So this is uh, simply you can set what the gain would be, double it, halve it, that kind of thing. Um, so, we, so we connect the white noise source that we've made to the gain node that we've created. So we're kind of starting to put this graph together where the noise source goes into, a, into the gain node. And then what we can do is an individual parameter of that. Oh, what's going on now? There we go. It thinks it's night time. <laughs> Probably is. So, so what we can do is we have a gain node, and the gain has a um, has a parameter called gain, and we can kind of automate that parameter. So what we can say is linearly ramp the gain to the value of one. So it defaults to zero. In uh, well, that doesn't match that, does it? But in a short amount of time, <laughs> one millisecond, and then ramp it down over the course of half a second. So we can kind of say, ramp it up and then ramp it down. So that gives us a kind of simple envelope around that, um, around that white noise. And then what we want to do is filter that. So remove the high frequencies. So that was the last part of our kind of gunshot noise. So, so the Web Audio API is providing us with a bi-quad filter, so a sort of two-pole filter. So we can say, I want the low pass filtering and set the kind of common parameters to that. Um, and then connect it up, so connect the gain node to the filter. So that's, that's sort of how the gunshot noise is working. So, yeah, I'm kind of a bit of a, oh, a bit of a lightning tour through the through some of the features, but I think that's the simplest way to show you the kind of things. The level, at least, that you're operating at with this API, so you're not having to write filter code yourself and that kind of thing. You're, you're being able to take a filter off the shelf and connect it up and set some parameters to it to kind of do the, some common operations quite quickly. So we thought we'd kind of uh, look around and try and recreate some kind of other sounds. So I'm going to show you a few things now that give you an idea of, of what the API is capable of. That was the, that was the kind of sciencey bit. So, uh, so this is another photo, it's an archive photo from the Radiophonics workshop. This is Daphne Oram, a composer there. Uh, I like the way that she's composing with a slide rule. I think that's quite good. The best way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so behind her is this, uh, is this device here, which when I was at university, we had a lot of these in the lab, um, sort of Brule and Care signal generators, and swept sign generators, and they were used to they were used at this time, I think, to measure the kind of acoustic properties of recording studios. You measured reverberation time, that kind of thing with them. So one was left behind as the story goes, and uh, the, uh, the people at the Radiophonics Workshop realized that if you could, uh, if you reduce the frequency to kind of audible musical frequencies, then you could kind of generate some sort of spacey sounds. And they called it the wobulator. So this thing here is the wobulator. Uh, yeah, it kind of goes a little bit back. So it might seem kind of... It's kind of primitive, but what they were doing to generate tunes and play notes before was to kind of record each individual note onto a piece of tape and then kind of splice it together. So having bits of kit where you could kind of grab a knob and move it around, you could kind of play a tune with it, and it was a quicker way of getting the notes onto tape than it was splicing them. Another thing that I saw in a paper, a book about this was they had a keyboard with lots of, you know, an octave's worth of kind of keys, and each one was turning on and off an individual oscillator, sort of a sine wave oscillator. So they had a bank of, you know, sort of 12 oscillators above each one tuned, and you could kind of play a sort of tune on these things, which I guess they drifted all over the place. And, but it was sort of time-saving, I guess, um, and very inventive, I think. 
Um, so yeah, we're kind of interested in the wobulator. Uh, if you want to know what it sounds like, here's a piece of Delia Darbish's music, uh, which kind of features it. So that kind of wee wee music sound is the wobulator, punctuating it. So the so the wobulator was a kind of modulated oscillator, effectively. So you had a you had an, an, an oscillator, and you were controlling the frequency of that oscillator with another oscillator. So you could kind of wobble the main frequency around uh, by a small amount. And the amount that you wanted to wobble it around is kind of controlled by how much, what the amplitude of that kind of um, modulating oscillator was. So let's have a look at that a little bit in code before I show you the demo. So you can create oscillators in the Web Audio API. They default to be sine wave, but you can uh, um, you can pick other common types. Um, in most of the implementations, they're kind of fully anti-alias, you can go up through frequencies and there's no aliasing. Um, and you can also kind of specify your uh, oscillators in terms of their frequency components, or in the frequency domain as well as the time domain. So you can make an oscillator like this and connect it to your destination. And then remember, so that's this lower part of the diagram here, an oscillator connected to a destination. And then we have another oscillator connected to the frequency parameter of that oscillator. So we can create uh, another oscillator and connect it to the frequency parameter. And then if we start both the oscillators, then we get that. So this is showing one of the interesting features of the Web Audio API where all of the parameters of all the nodes are kind of controllable with other audio rate parameters, which is you can do some quite interesting things. And you can get yourself into trouble as well, which is one of the things that I personally quite like about it. You can create feedback loops and those kind of things in quite a lot of noise quite quickly and it's not stopping you from doing those things which kind of allows people to be quite creative with it I think and, and do things with it that we hadn't expected they would want to do. So uh, we did a recreation of the wobulator which I'm going to show you if I can. So, so yep, yeah, this is our wobulator. This might be a little bit loud. I don't know if we can ride it down a little bit. That was quite a lot of fun. Maybe not for my colleagues, but for me, I enjoy that very much. There's a reason why I'm no longer at the BBC. May or may not be related to that. We don't. So a little bit of a tour. So you've seen some of the nodes that are available through the Web Audio API. Um, we've seen the audio buffer for creating kind of arbitrary samples. You can do things like load music in from web sources into buffers and manipulate them. Oscillators we've seen. Uh, the biquad filter, gain. Uh, there's a Hannah for kind of moving things around. So one of the primary use cases of the API is for gaming, where you kind of want to position sounds in, in um, kind of in simulated acoustic spaces. So there's kind of an equal power panner, but there's also a um, head-related transfer function-based panner um, for, for doing kind of quite, quite interesting sort of positional audio stuff. You can, there's a convolution filter. The script processor is there so that you can write um, audio processing code, it will just yield you a block of samples, 1,024 samples, say that's configurable, and then you can operate on them. So if you can fit your processing logic into that sort of time clock, you can kind of get stuff that's introducing quite low latency, but allowing you to just work at the sample level and do quite interesting things. Uh, there's a delay node. There's dynamic compression, so um, it's quite useful for, for, um, for 
radio and game, when you join lots of different nodes together and you kind of want to flatten stuff out, you can kind of put a compressor at the end. And there's full support for multi-channel interfaces, so you can kind of address a sort of more kind of, I guess, sort of home cinema, but also kind of pro audio type requirements with that. Um, a couple of things I haven't mentioned is it integrates well with uh, microphone and webcam input, so you can kind of do this audio processing um, on the input from, from the microphone, so that's starting to get used for kind of echo cancellation and that kind of thing in video conferencing applications. And one thing that makes me really happy, and I don't know why, but I'm always excited about it, is there's kind of MIDI support, so you can kind of connect uh, MIDI devices to the browser and use that to... Is that actually real now? Is Web MIDI real? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, for quite a while it was available through a shim, um, but it's recently landed in Chrome. So you can get that, I think, probably if you've got the beta version of Chrome, you can get Web MIDI. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I hope it will come in other browsers. I think we're having a little bit of a hard time with Mozilla convincing them there's a good idea. They, they, they have a lot of other things to do, so it's not made it quite at the top of their priority list. But, but yeah, hopefully. Um, there's, there's a lot of push from people to have MIDI support. Um, I met some people from Yamaha and Korg at a meeting, and they were really interested in it, in the MIDI support, sort of um, orthogonal to the whole audio. They're not so interested in creating instruments in the browser necessarily, but a lot of what they do, so if you buy a, I don't know, a guitar effects pedal or a synthesizer from some of these companies, they often ship a CD-ROM with it, which is kind of what you can use to configure that synthesizer or that drum machine using a desktop application. And the problem with having a CD-ROM is it's kind of the software goes out of date and shipping updates for it is quite difficult. Supporting, you know, all the different operating systems it might want to run on is quite hard. So they'd really like to just say, you know, if you bought one of our synthesizers, go to Yamaha.com and plug it in, and you can kind of configure it and share your configurations between other users and so on over the web. And yeah, that, that's kind of a, an interesting use case that I hadn't thought of. That's quite exciting. So I wanted to do a few little demos now, so I'm going to have to go to the back here, but I want to show a few little demos of what you can do today with the Web Audio API. So the first one is an interesting uh, kind of game that you can play to sort of compose music at the same time as other people and with other people. Um, uh, I'll, I'll fire it up and then I'll talk about it. Is it going to work? I didn't test the web connection very thoroughly when I arrived. So what's happening is we're connecting to a kind of uh, a sort of real-time pub sub server that is going to stream the events from other users into our browser while we send events to them. And then the music that you hear is all being kind of created dynamically inside the browser. If it's going to work. Uh, maybe. I hope not. Hmm. That's a shame. I hope this isn't a... Yeah, if it starts plinking away in the background, we'll know what's happening and I'll switch back to it. Let's try a different one. So I asked at the beginning if people were kind of interested in education and, and kind of teaching, um, teaching other people about music and sound and so on. So this is a really nice example. It's quite simple, but I, I like it a lot. It's a, it's a website that explains why certain drum loops or certain drum breaks are funky. It's called Funklet. So this was James Brown's drummer. Um, so this is what the... Uh, the, the um, the beat that he played in this record sounded like, and it got sampled a lot and used for lots of other music. One, two, three, four, get it! So 
So that's kind of a, a sample of that recording. So what this person does is takes those recordings and then has created this little kind of widget at the top, which is using sample drum sounds in the Web Audio API to kind of recreate that drum loop. And then he describes, you know, for drummers, but people who are interested, like why it sounds funky, why it sounds the way it does. So we can play it. And we can toggle off various instruments. And we can kind of push it a little bit in time as well to see like how much you push it before it loses its kind of its characteristic sound. So I, I really like that. It's quite simple, but it's showing, you know, we can move these sounds in real time and trigger them, and it's still sounding in time. There's no, I can resize the browser window. I can move things around. It's not going to drop any of these sounds really. Um, but it's in, more interactive than just a loop would be and just a, just a play button that I hit at the beginning. It lets you kind of move things around and change it and try and understand it yourself. The next one, let's see if Plink has come back up. Mm -hmm. it may be that the, maybe that the servers are down, that's possible. Let's try this one. So, so this is a, um, a sort of massively sampled uh, piano simulator. So they've sampled lots of different, uh, so lo all the notes across the piano, but also at different kind of velocities, so that you can kind of play a synthesized piano, and it sounds uh, sounds like a more like a piano than a simple um, uh, synthesized version. So it's using samples. Sounds, it sounds quite quite good, and all that needs to be sent to the browser for this to play back then once the samples has been loaded is just the, the kind of note information themselves. It's sort of like a very small, um, you could think like a MIDI file. So there is some stuff here for doing MIDI in and out. I didn't bring a MIDI keyboard, so I can't show that. But, um, but what it does let you do is record. If you do connect your keyboard, you can record it for other people to listen to. So there's kind of some uploaded... Uh, songs that people have, have done. Not quite as good as the, uh, the one that ships with it. So I think that's quite nice too. It's um, showing that we're starting to see kind of some of the things that have... So something like Google Docs, which is kind of taken off in quite a big way and lets you collaborate in a kind of Microsoft Word style environment with other people. At the beginning it wasn't very full featured and a lot of people were saying, oh, it's, you know, it's not going to take over from, from you know, the full desktop software, but what it does do is leverage the, the strength of the web, which is you know, that everyone can visit it by just visiting a URL in whatever browser they have and start collaborating. And we're starting to see some applications like that um, for music as well. So they may at the moment not have the power that we're accustomed to with sort of more specialist software, but they're kind of allowing people to collaborate and change things. So there's a piece of software called NoteFlight, which has been developed by one of the people involved in the working group. And, he's, um, and it's sort of a Google Docs for sheet music. Um, so you can kind of edit sheet music and collaborate on um, pieces of sheet music with other musicians. Um, but to get a kind of consistent rendering experience, irrespective of what hardware you happen to have connected, it uses Web Audio API. So it might not sound like a fantastic rendering of this piece of music, but at least you know that all of your colleagues are hearing the same thing, which is quite useful when you're not in the same studio together. Uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a plug here. 
So I'm quite interested in analog synthesizers and analog synthesis, so I've been writing some articles on, on my blog about um, kind of how synthesizers work or used to work analog synthesizers and how you kind of go about recreating some of those sounds with the Web Audio API. Um, so I kind of like this idea of being able to embed examples and that sort of stuff in line with the text and have more kind of interactive documents, if you like. So yeah, so finally, so this is the, this is the website that, that we put together um, at the BBC, at BBC R&D, about the Radiophonic Workshop. So it's at webaudio.prototyping.bbc.co.uk. If you search for Wobulator on Google, it will probably come up as well. Um, so we kind of uh, wanted to put together uh, not only the demos, but also a little bit of history and some kind of archive photography and then some code so that other people, so we made all the code open source so that people could kind of study it and learn about the API. Um, yeah, so you get a little bit of information about each demo, you get the demos themselves, so here's some simulated tape loops which you can play and adjust the speed and try and play them in time um, to see how that kind of process worked. And then uh, the code itself is kind of documented and, and annotated so you can kind of study how that works. So yeah, one, one last demo. So this is, the, uh, this is our simulation of the ring modulator, which was used for creating the sounds of the voices of the Daleks and the Cybermen in Doctor Who. So a ring modulator, so, so kind of mathematically what's happening is you're kind of multiplying two signals together. You can do that in the Web Audio API. It doesn't sound particularly um, authentic or kind of have that historical sound because the the real, uh, the real ring modulator, the analog circuits that were used in the kind of early Doctor Who episodes were analog circuits. And what you'd have is a box um, with this kind of circuit in there. That's the ring that gets its name from the ring of diodes. And you would plug a tape machine into the box and that would be your modulation frequency. So it would have a 30 hertz sine wave or something recorded on it in a loop and that would be playing uh, through there and then the microphone uh, yeah, you could speak into off stage and create the voices. So you had all these things like the kind of wobble on the tape and the sort of, you know, not running at a constant speed and also the fact that these diodes kind of bled a little bit. Um, you know, they weren't, um, they weren't perfect kind of gates, if you like, perfect. Um, yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, so we kind of did a little bit of a simulation of that to try and capture some of those effects. So i just find out. So in our simulation, this is the tape loop, so you can change the speed of the tape, and then the microphone goes into the ring modulator box at the bottom. And the distortion control is kind of changing the amount of uh, distortion that you get from those simulated diodes. Exterminate! 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 <laughs> Might want to turn it down a little bit. Upgrading is compulsory. Upgrading is compulsory. And if you have a browser that supports it, you can plug the microphone in and kind of do your own, uh, do your own version of that too. Yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. I just want to thank uh, these people who I worked with, Pete, Olivia, Andrew, and Matt. Olivia is the uh, chair of the Web Audio Working Group, uh, works at the BBC, and is a good person to talk to about kind of all of that um, administrative and uh, high level kind of how this is working and where it's going and, and those kind of things. Um, and he's here at the BBC and these are some colleagues at the BBC who helped me build those demos. Yeah, thank you very much and I'll take any questions. There's a microphone coming up. Thank you. Uh, could you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, have you ever worked with Super Collider? So I haven't worked with Super Collider um, myself, 
but so the person who designed and proposed the API in not quite the form it is today, but close to that, was a guy called Chris Rogers at uh, Google, or well, formerly at Google, he's no longer there. And before he worked at Google, he worked at Apple, and he built the um, core audio subsystem for um, what became Mac OS X. And he worked with the, on that with the guy who did Super Collider. So, so he said that there's at least, um, yeah, a kind of spiritual ancestry of this stuff through Super Collider. If not, if the API is not necessarily based on it, there's kind of influences. There are any substantial differenti differences you can just tell us? I'm afraid I can't because I'm not that familiar with Super Collider. Um, yeah, I suspect you can do, today you can probably do more with Super Collider than you can with Web Audio API, but I think the concept of kind of chaining together blocks and being able to, is, is that sort of influence, it's that way of working with audio. Um, you can work at the sample level and manipulate individual samples, but <coughs> the kind of sweet spot for the API is to be able to just chain these kind of blocks together. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, actually, I did my research for the last three months on Web Audio API. What I found out uh, mostly challenging about Web Audio API is the timing and the scheduling. Like coming from a like pure data background, and like this is so easy to do. Like we have just like a Metro object, but I'm, I'm, I know that there are workarounds for it, like combining the JavaScript timing and. Uh, the timing for the web audio, but is there any plan for a specific node that's going to handle the timing for web audio specifically? So there's no plan at the moment, so I haven't seen anything like that. So when that issue comes up um, on the kind of mailing list and our, our discussions, the point that's usually made is that because we're at quite an early stage, what we haven't seen yet is um, developers building libraries on top of web audio. So there's a couple of game libraries now that abstract away the kind of the synchronization of audio with, um, with kind of canvas-based animation and using the animation timers and kind of make that a little bit easier um, or more familiar to people who are used to working with kind of game APIs. I think we'll start to see that more for um, more musical-based applications, kind of yeah, scheduling and those kind of things. I do see people trying that kind of thing. I mean, the, yeah, the argument has always been to make the API not so low level that it's so difficult to work with, but to recognize that if we give developers the power, then they will build interesting abstractions on top of it that are suited to particular use cases. And so for people who come to the Web Audio API and wanting to do the kind of things that they're used to with, with other environments, at the moment it's quite frustrating, but I think when the API gets more widely adopted, you will start to see libraries that are kind of abstracting away, making it more, intu more um, intuitive. Yeah, and you know, if you're in the position to, to start writing libraries like that or kind of contributing some of the, the ideas that you've come up with in, in your research, I think it's a really great time to do that. You'll get a lot of support. Yeah, I actually started like, for example, I, uh, for this particular use case, I started using the script processor node for, as an event source, which turns out it's not actually the best type because it, it has to come and come and like back and forth between the execution thread. So, yeah, yeah I mean, like there are, st the, like if, if that happens, like it's more exciting for the musical part of it. That's my point. So that's like, for example, this talk is basically aimed towards like musical application people. Yeah. So it, if that like being like, it, it's already there, like the plugins, as you said, I mean, it would be really useful for the API to handle that as well. Yeah, I mean, I just, if you've got real world experience of doing things, I'd really encourage you to just write a little bit about your experiences and share them with the public W3C mailing list. You usually get quite a good response. If you say, I've tried to do this, here's the code I came up with, either someone will come in and say, ah, did you try it like this way and give you a bit of hand that way? Or they'll say, yeah, that's a really good point. And we've, you know, we'll kind of try and make that a little bit easier. Um, we've just, moved all of the spec and the issue tracking to GitHub to make it a little bit easier for developers to kind of see what we're working on next and to 
file bugs with the spec itself, and that's quite a good place for them as well. And you say, I've tried to do this, I can't, you know, and, then, and then hopefully it will, yeah, people will start thinking about better ways of addressing it. A lot of, the, a lot of what you'll hear, especially now, is mm, we might wait for a bit because there's a lot of the spec that's kind of underspecified and needs some work, and so feature enhancements or new features are getting punted a little bit, but I think there will be an appetite to come back to those and make sure that they're available. Um, I wondered if there was, if the way the API was suitable for doing object-based audio mixing, and could it be? And could, I, you, could you give me a quick kind of what's object-based? So, I hear, uh, so I this is something, lot, another, bit of, another, another bit of R&D are doing in the BBC, which is uh, rather than have multi-channel sound, you describe your audio in terms of objects and its environment. And I wondered if there'd been any look, looking at that for the, using, doing that for a web API. As, a, as developing tools for doing object-based mixing. Yeah. Um, so I spoke to Tony a little bit about Tony Chernside about that a little bit. I think you could write some code that was able to 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 translate from your kind of object-based environment to whatever the multi-channel output of that would be. I think Chris Pike up there did something with binaural rendering, so into so how does it? How do you say? When you try to give the um, give the impression of a multi-channel setup on two uh, on headphones um, by using kind of the convolution filter to do that. So that seemed to at least. I mean, I thought it sounded really good, and and it wasn't. It, although it was doing sort of 20, maybe 25 simultaneous convolution filters on my machine and in Chrome, it was coping fine with that. Um, what else is there? So Matt Parody on the far right there is looking, so his background is in sort of ambisonics and he's looking at kind of writing file format converters for ambisonic file formats to, to web audio. Um, so you could kind of load them in and it would do the necessary JavaScript for you to do ambisonic reproduction. Um, and have I seen anything else along those lines? Oh yeah, and Chris Pike was talking to me about maybe switching out the head-related transfer functions in the panner node and making that kind of user-specifiable. So I think at a moment, it's specified to just ship with a standard set, maybe mm -hmm. produced by ERCAM or something, a kind of standard HRTFs. And could you come up with a file format for HRTFs and allow those to be loaded in so that you could kind of do those sort of, yeah. I have another question as well, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, uh, has anyone uh, expressed a desire to, or do you know of anyone who's trying to emulate old-fashioned synthesizers, Moogs and other great classics in the API? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it's, I think when this thing came along, so one of the interesting parts about it was it was designed with sort of game audio in mind and kind of that sort of sample scheduling, but as soon as you mentioned these types of... Um, this type of API, you kind of get the early adopter people, and they tend to be people who are really excited, you know, like me, so excited about kind of synthesis and, and doing those sort of things. So, um, so yeah, there are a few kind of synthesizer. Um, I, grab me afterwards, and I'll give you a link. But there's a few kind of synthesizer things, and then stuff like the oscillator node is, wasn't originally in the spec, and it came because a lot of people were asking for those sort of things. So, um, there's not everything in there. You can't do like hard oscillator syncing, which I think is quite useful for a lot of um, effects. So there's not a way of kind of resetting the phase of oscillators. Um, you kind of have to hack around those sort of things. But, but yeah, people are making quite convincing simulations of yeah, various synths. There's one at the front here. Um, I've had to play with a, a few examples and uh, one thing I've noticed, because I'm obviously trying to break it, um, is when you switch to a, a tab that, that's separate from the one running the audio, interesting things start to happen. I have no idea what they are. I was wondering if you might be able to explain what goes on there. So what's happening probably in Chrome, you're seeing that, is what they do with... Um, so each, each tab is running in a different process, and so 
those processes are given kind of different priorities depending on whether or not they're in focus or not. And at the moment, the audio thread goes with that particular thread's focus. So if you defocus the tab, then it starts to deprioritize it and you will start to, yeah, drop samples or whatever. The, the usual kind of things that you'd get if you kind of start throttling the CPU on that particular. Something that um, has been considered in development at all? Yeah, or? it's been considered. So, so the issue with it, from our point of view, is that there's nothing in the specification about what happens with tabs. So the kind of spec doesn't it doesn't concern itself with the surrounding kind of browser operating ecosystem, if you like, or the kind of the, the, the environment which the Web Audio API is running in. And that's kind of deliberate because we'd like the Web Audio API to maybe be available in server-side applications and anywhere that JavaScript is available, perhaps. Um, so it's kind of a browser vendor thing. So, so if you're seeing it and, and there's a reason so, so there's a good application that you want, so like background music playing or something like this. Um, the best place is to raise it kind of as a bug with, the, with, with Chrome or, or Safari or Firefox or wherever you're seeing it. And the, so that, there are discussions happening within those organizations about kind of what you do. Um, the problem if you don't do those kind of things is that, th is that background tabs can quite quickly you know, steal a lot of resources from the thing that you're interested in. And you know, that's that's quite difficult for them to deal with, but yeah. Okay. I think there was one just in the middle there. Is that? Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah, I was um, just curious how demanding um, all this technology is on the computer and the micro underneath. And you've kind of answered a little bit with the tabs, but if you can start putting lots of filters in and put high sample rates in, then you're, you're surely going to just dominate the whole machine. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a concern. So, so the proposal. So there was another proposal on the table in the early days of this working group from Mozilla, and they made the. Uh, I think quite a sensible argument is that you've got JavaScript already. Just give the developer access to the raw samples, and you can process them in JavaScript. The API becomes really simple, and all of the processing is offloaded to, um, yeah, to, to JavaScript libraries, and they can be reused and the graphics and anything else that you need. Um, and then it was quite quickly shown for, for even the kind of simple use cases that that model broke down quite quickly, and it was because it was so processor intensive to do, yeah, to do kind of room-based reverberation simulations, that kind of thing that you'd need in games. So that's where the kind of web audio API proposed by Google won out, won out because, the, um, because a lot of these common operations are actually handled at kind of low level co optimized code in the browser itself, um, which helps a lot with this kind of, yeah, resource usage. Um, we have a couple of chip manufacturers involved with the working group, and they're, they're paying attention because if this kind of stuff takes off and it starts to make it, especially on mobile devices that are underpowered, then they'd like to provide kind of chip-level optimizations for these kind of use cases. And if it's a standard that's available, you know, it's going to be available on every browser on the phone or browsers on the phone, then, you know, they might be able to kind of head off some of the performance concerns by optimize, optimizing for it at the sort of silicon level. Does that answer your question? The, the, only re the only real answer is kind of, depending on your application, you have to build it and test it on a bunch of different browsers. Yeah, and I mean, I, and, and a mobile phone. I was just thinking, if with a lot of JavaScript, you could create a 48-track mixer with bicrop filters on every single channel, and it won't work. <laughs> it'll, it'll crash. Yeah. So, so what's the actual sort of genuine sort of um, load you can stick on it? So. So I mean, I've, I've seen, so the multi-channel support is a little bit, um, uh, it's not kind of fully there. So, so you, can address, you can address channels of sound cards, but you can't address multiple sound cards and that kind of thing at the moment. So it's sometimes difficult to kind of test this to like very high channel. But I've seen, I've seen demos working with 12 to 20 channels playing simultaneous things and, and with a virtual mixer. This but seems but to running at 44.1 kilohertz. Perhaps, yeah. Nasty channel. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 
I think when people started putting digital audio workstations on computers, people thought they were crazy because they would never perform as well as, you know, analog tape or digital tape. And over time, the kind of the advantage of being able to do nonlinear editing on a large screen and the increases, you know, Moore's law and the increases in processing power means that, you know, nowadays it's a kind of, you know, it's a die-hard kind of engineer who will do all their recording on analog curious, tape. You know, just how much loading it does create, whether it's sort of not worth worrying about. I'm quite surprised at how much you can do and not notice the difference. But you're right. I think the what you can do in the browser today versus what you can do in a dedicated desktop application, there's there's a difference definitely. You can do more in a dedicated desktop application, but where it might win out is in the, you know when these applications come along that let you collaborate online and access your kind of tracks from any machine in the building or any machine in the world and, and work on them, you know, in a couple of years, computers are, you know, five, ten times faster than they are today, then those kind of performance considerations may not be, may not be as significant. But the point you raise about mobile devices is, is definitely, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of talk and concern about mobile devices, yeah, in, in, the, in the web audio group at the moment about, yeah, the optimizations that you have to do to kind of access samples and large volumes of audio data and but preventing kind of race conditions and concurrency issues when you when you're in environments that are, they need to be massively parallelized or massively multi-threaded in order to take advantage of kind of low power chips and that kind of thing Thank you very much, Chris, on behalf of everybody here. Um, the lesson today, I believe, is stop everything you're doing now and do it again in JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> because it's coming whether you like it or not. So, thank you, thank very, you much. very much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Last thing to say is because I'm not Rupert Murdoch, I can thank the BBC twice. So thanks once again for the venue. Um, I plug the event again next month, November the 12th. Dolby Theatre, Soho Square. Um, and if you want to join the AES or you're interested in what we do and you're not already a member, please get in touch with us via our website, aes-uk.org, and, um, and have a word with us via the contact form. We'll be very happy to talk to you. Thank you very much.